Thanks for your patience. We just had some official business we had to take care of. So we always start with the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. So if you could all rise. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And we never like to keep Suffolk waiting. So if we could have Suffolk come forward and, and Brian, as well, for the village of Port Jefferson. We'll do public safety comments. Then we have some uh, special recognition. We have two public hearings, board trustees reports, and then comments for the general public. Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Linda Petrowski. I'm from the 6th Precinct COPE office. Thanks so much for having me. I'm just going to give you a quick update on what's been going on in the village. Um, we're going to be looking at just a general time frame from 7-4 uh, until 8-1. Overall, just to let you know, we do have a little bit of an uptick in criminal incidents, but it appears that most of those are going to be relative to harassments. Um, so most of those we have a uh, complainant parties that are unwilling to move forward or proceed with those so all right for this time frame we don't have any aggravated harassments we have no assault burglaries and no robberies which are fantastic we do have four criminal mischief incidents three of those are active one has already been closed by an arrest we have three grand larceny incidents two of those are relative to um, to some identity theft issues, so we always want to remind people to be checking your credit reports, bank statements, credit statements, and make sure that you don't see anything suspicious, and if you do, to let your, um, your banks and credit card companies know immediately. So we have three of those are active right now, so openly being investigated. Our harassments, we have two that are active that had just occurred and seven that refused to move forward. And then our pettit larcenies, we have five active. Uh, most of those are relative to um, shoplifting, and I believe there was one that was relative to a theft from a vehicle. So let's see. For our non-criminal incidents, uh, we've stayed pretty steady with our ambulance calls. We had 80 for this particular time frame. Our overdoses for ambulance calls, we did have two during this time period. And then our general disturbances have stayed just about the same from this time last year. We were at 59. And our total non-criminal incidents were 295 for this period. Uh, moving on to our motor vehicle accidents, we have gone down considerably, which I'm very happy to report. We went down to 12 from 27 for this same time frame, and zero fatalities. Uh, during this time period, we had six arrests and seven charges uh, for our criminal and non-criminal activity altogether. Outside of that, I just wanted to let you know our next 6th Precinct community meeting is going to be Tuesday, August 9th at 10 a.m., and that is hosted at the Precinct in Selden. If you'd like to come, it gives a big um, detailed, uh, the whole entire precinct, not just your area, but everywhere that the 6th Precinct encompasses. You can get a real idea of what's going on in other areas within the precincts. It's very, very informative. If you've never been to one, I suggest you know trying to make one we alternate days to evenings. So for August, it'll be a daytime meeting. For September, it'll be a 7 p.m. meeting for, for those that work during the day. Uh, outside of that, we have a very big event coming up tomorrow night. I don't know if everybody's aware, National Night Out is being held in, at the Center Reach Pools. And that is a free community event. There's going to be free swimming. I don't know if you're familiar with the complex. They have a really beautiful pool area, um, sprinkler park area for the kids. They have basketball courts, playgrounds, and we're going to be having a DJ, different vendors, and it's just a very large community event that's going to happen um, yearly. We've been doing it at that location, and we usually have between 600 and 1,000 people attend. So it's, it's, it's a really great night. Um, tons of the, you know, the department's going to be there. Our deputy inspector's going to be there, some of our elected officials as well. So it's just a really great night for the family, and it's free. So... Um, Last couple of things, there's been a little bit more of an uptick in the catalytic converter thefts. 
they had been countywide rampant. Then they went down. Now we're starting to see a little bit coming back up. So we just want to remind everybody there are some anti-theft um, prevention ideas that you know we're putting out there. Some of them are etching either your license plate or your VIN number into your catalytic converter. A body shop can help you with that. Uh, we're reminding everybody to, to maintain parking in well-lit areas. They do have anti-theft uh, anti devices, excuse me, like cages or shields that can be installed. Again, something through a body shop that would have to be done. Uh, just things that they want us to put out there to make sure that everybody is aware that it's starting up again. Hopefully we can, we can keep that keep that at bay again. And then one last thing, we have some flyers on the back. Um, I know that we're gonna touch on that a little bit again, just some pedestrian safety, seeing and be seen, some things from the department that we'd like you guys to just grab one and take a look at. So do we have any questions, reference this? Yes. It is countywide. Every neighborhood, uh, and, and it's go, it is going in waves. We were getting hit in Mount Sinai Miller Place for a little while, then that, that calmed down. Um, I think that there was some issues up in Poquot, and then, like for our precinct in particular, it's been everywhere. We've had Selden, we've had Center Reach, um, it's been in Quorum, Medford, Stony Brook, Port Jeff Station, so it's been everywhere. But as far as I know, countywide, with some of the data that they share with us, it has not been um, just in one area. All the precincts are getting hit ter like terribly hard with the with that. That's why we actually have, I don't know if you are familiar with our Instagram or the Twitter that the, the precincts puts out, also headquarters and the commissioner have a feed as well. And we are constantly putting out that we're just really hoping that people will just remember to lock the car doors, remove any belongings that are valuable. Uh, a lot of the thefts are happening from unlocked vehicles. So people are starting at one end of the block and they'll just check every car and whoever's open, they pop in, they see what they can find, take whatever they can get and then move on. We've seen them on videos. They check the car door, it's locked, they move on to the next one. So it's been uh, a huge uptick in open door thefts. We haven't been seeing as many windows getting broken as we had back in the day, especially movie theaters and malls, we were getting hit like crazy. People would break windows. Now they're realizing that there's enough open open doors that they don't have to do that extra effort. There's been a pattern that you can tell. There is not a specific pattern because there's actually many, many different groups of people doing it. It's not like one single crime pattern. When we have one group of people that we can identify as being the group, then we have a crime pattern that we put on it and then we have investigators do that. It's, it's a general pattern because there's so many people that are jumping on the bandwagon per se and, and looking to get easy money. Um, also, just a reminder to not t uh, leave your key fobs in the cars. Most of our stolen vehicles now in the 6th Precinct are vehicles that have the keys. They either people leave them right in the, uh, in the cup holder or in the glove box and somebody might be going in to look for some loose change and then they find keys and they go, I'll just take the whole car. And then also a lot of people um, are leaving the, the cars running while they're going into like 7-Eleven and whatnot and people just jump right in and take off. It's a, a crime of opportunity. Sometimes people aren't even planning on stealing a car when you get them. They're like, well, I wasn't even planning on it, but they did it right in front of me, so I just did it. So just, just a, no. a reminder, you know, you, sometimes, you know, you, you live in a great area, you're used to just feeling safe. You know, sometimes we forget, but it's always good to make sure we're locking everything up. Any other questions? Yes. Um, just Pat, you got to come up to the microphone because we are YouTubing it, so that way everybody gets to hear you. Okay. Sorry, Pat Ryan. <laughs> Pat Zimmerman, 175 Wynwood Court South. There are two things that are going on in our area across from uh, Jefferson Plaza. Number one, uh, people are sleeping behind the hedges by the bank that just closed, well, mm -hmm. not just closed, the bank that closed, 
and they're breaking into the bank and the back part of the building. Is this the old TFCU? Yeah. 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 Yes, we've actually been in contact with the manager there uh, within the last week or so because we've been trying to advise them of suggestions for security and what we can do to try to improve that location. Um, we've suggested removing the bushes. We've suggested um, cordoning off the entire porch area or fencing the entire property. They are open to our suggestions. When we had that conversation, I think it was about a week and a half ago, okay. um, they were looking into how they could fence, um, and they actually thought that they might physically remove the entire porch if it was feasible. I think that's something that they have to go through um, maybe the building department to make sure that that's allowed as well. Mm -hmm. But they are uh, taking our suggestions and we're having an open conversation about it. So I'm hoping that we can move forward with that because that is an issue that we regularly are touching on. Just know, although it is a public safety matter, it is outside the purview of the village of Port Jefferson. Right. So that, Yeah, that's why I addressed it to be the town of Brookhaven's <laughs> building and yeah. planning department. The other department. thing is there's a um, Caribbean grocery across the street from the bank on mm -hmm. uh, 112 that they have music so loud if you're driving past with your windows mm -hmm. open it's startling they're blocked by carvel and oh you can hear it from the roadway oh yeah have you have you called the police to to um to report a noise I disturbance left a mess yeah i did but okay because okay. if you call the 852 cops line and you let them know about uh you know that noise disturbance is currently going on the sector operator for that particular area when okay. it comes by if you can hear the music outside of their property and it's causing a disturbance which would be um, we would need your call to tell us it's disturbing somebody they would be able to issue them a summons for that or at least have the discussion to let them know that they will get a summons right. down the line all right thank you so much oh, no problem okay. thank you pat public safety for suffolk officer piotrowski did i say that correctly yes. thank you great thank you for your report yeah. We have newly uh, promoted Lieutenant Frank here from Port Jeff Village Code. If you have any more local code related safety concerns or comments, Lieutenant Frank is here to accommodate and also give us a report. Good evening, everyone. And uh, unfortunately, Chief Lou could not be here, so he asked me to, to step in and certainly cover a couple of things. Um, one of the things that um, uh, Suffolk County just mentioned was about pedestrian safety. Uh, one of our concerns certainly is that when we talk about pedestrian safety, that uh, that everybody's crossing on a crosswalk. Um, a lot of times, you know, you're walking down the you're driving down the village, and sometimes people walk in between cars out into the street. Obviously, your reaction time is going to be a little bit slower. I mean, a little bit fast, uh, not as fast. So we really ask that um, you go and, and you you stay in the crosswalk when you're crossing, because that's really what we're used to seeing, and that's really what drivers are used to seeing, day and night. Um, what Suffolk was very nice in bringing, and something that's available when you walk out is a flyer, okay? And it's on the seat over there, something that you can access and, and uh, take a look at. Um, also, it's, this, it's the time of the year, uh, pool safety, to be honest with you. You always want to make sure that um, access to pools uh, are, are controlled. Um, small children, if they are near a pool, that they are always being supervised. Gates around the pool are properly uh, secure and that we have no safety or any other concerns like that. Unfortunately, sometimes this time of year we hear some terrible stories uh, regarding the pool and small children, so just a little bit of a reminder about uh, what's going on. Um, if there's any questions that you have, certainly I, I can pass them along to Chief Lute, um, and we can make sure that he, uh, he receives them and also responds back to you in a, in a very timely fashion. You know, if you know Chief Lute, you know he's going to get back to you right away, so something to be aware of. So at this time, any, any questions that you may have? Uh, Kathleen Riley, 17 Leeward Lane. Uh, this really has to do with both of you because <laughs> just this past week, actually it was about oh, five days ago, I called uh, about um, a noise complaint. <laughs> it really was music that was playing, but way in the distance. And I'm like, I can hear it in my back deck of at the Highlands, okay? okay? And it's on the other side of the railroad track. So I got in my car to go find where it was, and sure enough, it's at the address 21 Maple Avenue, which is the next street um, south of the railroad tracks. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I know it's he's parallel to right. the railroad. And I called. I did call the police, and then about about half hour later, the music stopped. They were doing it again this on Sunday. Okay. So I didn't call Sunday. It wasn't. I couldn't hear it as loud, and I wasn't sitting out on my deck. And I'm going, okay, it's happening the same thing. 
it's, you know. Is it a private residence? Yes. Private and they just okay. blast the music in the backyard. I don't even know why the, the, the neighbors are not complaining. Yeah. Well, see, it's, the problem is we need the complainant because mm -hmm. in order for you to be able to ticket the Brookfield and town ordinance, yeah. the noise disturbance, using a speaker or a sound, um, a sound device, you have to have somebody that's the noise. So I will keep I will calling need them. You okay. to be annoyed, you know, for <laughs> me to be able to write that ticket. I just okay. need to say so that somebody was disturbed by this because right. he may have some sort of agreement with his neighbors, but he doesn't have an agreement with the people that live near past them. Right. So if you continue to call during the, you know, when it's actually happening, mm -hmm. when the officer responds, I'm presuming, I, uh, since I, I wasn't aware prior, I didn't look anything up, but I'm assuming that when you called, um, if after an officer responded, they let the music cue to getting a warning for mm -hmm. more summons. I'm not sure what would have happened, but, you know, it depends on the history and the officer responding type of discussion. But okay. to give a warning that first time. So okay. If they, if they continue with that, so at this point, continue calling so that we can address it this time. Okay, great. And it's 852 is the number I? 852 not 911. Not line. Oh. It does connect also to our same 911 dispatcher. So if you wanted to call the 911 direct, it's fine. What happens is if it's not a medical emergency, a domestic incident occurring in the moment, it, they will be a lower priority. So that's why it could take half an hour like that last incident. Oh, I understand. No. But they will get there. All right, it's the same you. in the village too. We have we have noise complaint. We can respond. We respond very quickly to these, and certainly address the issue immediately. Great. Um, so thank you. Absolutely. Any other questions? Great. Thank you, Lieutenant. Officer, have a nice evening. Stay safe. Thanks for your service. Oh, we're going to do a little recognition before we get into the two public hearings, Kevin. Just had a very successful event, the first annual port pause. <laughs> yeah, you can never say that. And uh, yes, nice sir. to done, Kevin. So go. I'm going to have my uh, volunteers come up. Uh, maybe just stand here to the right, and uh, I'll introduce you in a second. I'd like to give the board just a little bit of background on this event. I appreciate it, guys. Walter and Victoria. You can sit there if you want for now, and that and th that'll be fantastic. Thank you. So, uh, just a little background to the board and the public. Um, we did hold uh, what we think is going to be a legacy event in this uh, village to celebrate canines. Um, it ended up being, I think, a world-class event. The positiveness that has come from this event has been overwhelming. We are still taking in feedback. This is probably an early summary, but uh, it's all positive. And just, just a little in numbers, this was July 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. Uh, the, the feature part of this event was a dock diving element where uh, those could try to dock dive on Friday night, and those that succeeded were able to go on in competition on the 23rd and 24th. So by the numbers, we had about 1,500 plus people walk through the door, so to speak, at um, Barnum Avenue or Joe Erlen Field. We had 145 registrations, which by uh, any standard, uh, we were told by Doc Dogs has never happened on a first event. We, we just broke, broke the mold there completely. Um, there was a Belgian Malawan, I may not be saying that right, that uh, won the event. There you go. Uh, 22 feet, 10 inches, that dog jumped, which is incredible. And <laughs> it went 6 foot 10 inches high. Uh, thanks to the frigate for giving an extra prize to that particular dog. We had over 35 vendors. We had some really swell sponsors. We had a lot of support, including King O'Rourke, which was our featured presenting sponsor. And uh, to my knowledge, already has called us and said, we will support you for the end of time on this event. Uh, so we provided a lot of summertime fun, a lot of smiles, and I would say there is no negatives on this event except two that were glaringly uh, you know, it was hot. It was hot. Uh, I didn't mind it at all, but there were people that didn't bring their dogs out because they were concerned with the heat. The only other mishap was, and I'll refer to Mr. Rob Larravee, who was instrumental in connecting the fire hydrant to the pool. We filled a 27,000 gallon pool in 40 minutes. That usually takes five hours. There was a young fireman that was there holding the hose when he turned it on. I was 50 feet away, and I thought the event ended before it started. The hose came back, hit him in the face, and it, was, it scared me a lot. 
he ended up getting uh, just some lacerations and he's going to be fine. So uh, my hat's off to the bravery of, again, the fire department. Um, I just want to mention um, one of the things that we did was really smart was holding the event there because we really don't have a lot of events on the west end of town. And what we discovered was the admission aspect of it from a fundraising point of view is just tremendous. We raised $12,000 in $10 increments. To my knowledge, that's never even come close to happening before in this village, and this money is going directly to the uh, conservancy to do great things with. Now, how do we get those people here? I have to list these partners in media. Newsday, Greater Long Island, Long Island Press, Stan's Papers, WEHM, three radio stations, Discover Long Island, Patch, PortJeff.com, TBR News, Bring Fido, L.I. Dog, Getty Images, which I'm going to pass around. I can't believe Getty actually covered this event. That's, that's really, really fantastic. Just pass those around if you would, Bruce. Um, worldwide uh, images on that. Uh, All Rescues also uh, promoted it. All social media, Long Island Tea Podcast, and Scoop the News Hound came from Newsday. So. It was an incredible, incredible partnership in media. It was just a really, really great event. Uh, I want to thank everybody from the Conservancy for being behind this event. I'm going to name them, please. Chris Ryan, Karen Ryan, Larry LaPointe, Steve Velasquez, Lisa Perry, Betty Ann Marangiello, I hope I have that right, and Rob Laravia, who I believe is in the room here. Uh, Rob was really a strategic person for us in planning. He was able to do the operational things that I don't really like to do. I, I'm more of like sort of looking down the road kind of a thing, so thank you, Rob. And Nick Akampora and the Port Chef Fire Department, which I've mentioned before. Um, really, really fantastic. Now, to my main focus. Some volunteers that really came to the table for me. If you wouldn't mind standing up, Walter Parbadin? Parbadin, just say it quickly like that. And Victoria Snaden. You guys were great. They were here both Saturday and Sunday. I mean, I just, if you know my personality, I just like get, to get things done, and you guys followed that. That's not easy. You know, it was like, please do this, please do that. Learning on the fly incredibly, incredibly. Just to give you an example, Walter, I said, Walter, these are VIP seats. We got to get them clean. You know, from the day before, they were wet, there was stuff on them, and he was like, he did that, and he did so much more, and they were at the front lines. And Victoria, she was great, like, because Victoria started, like, you know, just kind of quiet, and then, uh, she got the script down, and it was, it was brilliant. It was so brilliant. I want you to give an example of what you said to people. Right on that mic there, please. Um, so first, I would have to give them a wristband. And then after I gave them the wristband, I would say, OK, so this wristband allows you to leave and come back as many times as you would like, however, whenever you would like. There are bathrooms to my right, vendors all along the fence, as well as a cooling station if you get too hot. Food trucks are at the back, and the competition starts at whatever time, or it's going on right now. If your dog is not a fan of water, there is a lure course that you can try for free. How did you wow. do that? <laughs> and this was like real-time training. Did, did she have to say incredible. that 12,000 times? <laughs> uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, pretty much. Thank you so much, volunteers. I want to mention also Rowan Casey, who couldn't be here tonight, and of course, uh, all the other volunteers over there. Your support as a board and the mayor, thank you so much, and the public support. Everybody, the incredible recreation department, people were really involved. I do have to quote one thing that uh, Betty did say, because Betty was there early when I mentioned this, and Betty said, um, not to me, he's out of his mind. <laughs> he, I don't know what he's trying to do, I don't, know what, I, you know, I don't know what he's up to, but he's out of his mind. Have you met Kevin yet? Uh, you know, and it's like, that, that's such a compliment. I just want to say, <laughs> I love that, thank you so much, and she couldn't, she was texting me Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday, it, so she loved it. And that says a lot. So thank you again, everybody. Thank you, Kevin. Well done. You want to do that now? Ready? One, two, three. Keep going. Smile. Woo! We're happy. Volunteers. Yay! 
Thank you. Okay, you can now take the keys and drive home after that, right? <laughs> okay, marching on. Uh, we have two public hearings, pretty basic stuff. Uh, first one uh, is to add Article 3 to Chapter 1 of the Village Code to regulate the use of video conferencing for village meetings. Uh, hand the baton to Mr. Egan. Even though he has that gorgeous, booming voice. You can use this one, huh? Use that one? Okay. Yeah. All right, good. Thanks. Uh, I can enjoy it without <laughs> No offense, yeah. Rebecca. No offense. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, terrible to follow that great port, pause, port pause <laughs> event topic with something so mundane as video conferencing at village board meetings. Um, this is not uh, the panacea that I think it was projected to be uh, to return to the days of Zoom and very interactive board meetings as we had during the COVID pandemic period. Uh, this was passed um, often, t as, as people know, uh, Mr. Piano knows, you know, at the last minute in Albany, they call it the big ugly in the budget process. That was what this, this uh, law is. Um, it is not a return to Zoom and all of those great things that we experienced interactively during the pandemic. This only allows uh, members of the public, of the board, of the public board itself, the planning board, board of trustees, or zoning board, to attend remotely, not members of the public. Um, and only when that member has an extraordinary circumstance. It cannot be that they're on vacation. It has to be something extraordinary, such as disability and illness. It's defined by the statute. Um, also, why this is really not that large of a saving grace, even though it is a bit of an opening under the public officer's law, is that um, the minimum number of members of the board still have to be here to create a quorum. So that member who is remoting in cannot be counted as the quorum, so the, 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 you must have a proper attendance present in the location for the quorum. Um, uh, again, physically present, extraordinary circumstances. The person has to be heard, seen, and identified. The only exception is that under the previous public officer's law, when someone remoted in, we had to publish where that person's location was. So if they were in a condo in Florida, they then had to say, I am staying in apartment G at the Coral Gables apartment on PGA Boulevard, and members of the public are welcome to attend. That was not often used because that was the requirement of the public officer's law. This, you do, this remoting in person does not have to do that as long as they have that extraordinary circumstance. Um, there are village clerk procedures that, that uh, apply to this with regard to minutes and archiving times. Uh, it, just it just allows uh, the village to be able to do this. Um, one other point is that uh, this will be revisited in January 2024 by the Committee on Open Government just to check its um, efficacy. So uh, the, uh, to, to, to utilize this, even for those emergency opportunities, um, we have to pass a local law just authorizing the ability under uh, Public Officer's Law 103A. 103-A. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, any comments from the board? Comments or questions? Any comments or questions from the public? Motion to close the public hearing. So moved by Deputy Mayor Snaden, seconded by Casse. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Don't go anywhere. I got one <laughs> Uh, the next public hearing is with respect to a paper street uh, known as Hunt Street. I, for all my years, I didn't know there was a Hunt Street. So paper street is a street that is still visible on the tax maps, but is not necessarily a, uh, an improved street or roadway. Um, so we have, I'd say maybe a dozen or so of these in the village that still exist. Drew, do you have one by your house? Avenue A. Yeah. Avenue, okay, that dead ends and then... So you're going to now learn the process by which you can seek an abandonment, hence your presence here this evening, probably. And um, uh, with that, I pass it to Attorney Egan. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this, is, this is so small. It's unusually small, Hunt Street. Um, I'll just hold this up just to see. It's in the trustees' packets. 
Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's in the public's packets. For another survey? No, okay. So there, there's a homeowner owns lot 25 and lot 24. This is a contiguous homeowner that's just split by this 40-foot stub of a street called Hunt Street. So it's a continuance of South Street across Correct. High. Yeah. High Street and South Street. South Street goes to the end. Hunt Street makes a left going north. Um, this little stump was asked to be um, abandoned um, under si section village state village law section 6-612. Uh, the village has the authority to lay out, alter, widen, narrow, discontinue, or accept dedication of a street in the village. Uh, this is a request as it terminates in a dead end. Uh, the north is land of St. Charles Hospital. So if the board approves it tonight, uh, the request is to abandon this identified stump of Hunt Street just by 40 by 30 feet um, to the adjoining homeowners upon the written consent of St. Charles because they are the adjoining homeowner to the north. And so Brian, who owns lot 24? The same property owner owns lot 25. So they will then just It'll be merge, is this going to be merged into one lot? Yes. Is that a requirement that we want to make? Is that where my, I don't want them to create a second lot that they can then improve. We c you can require that. What do you, you guys understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Right, because otherwise you're giving them an, another buildable lot and they go before the zoning board and they'd have a 40 foot deep lot. So, so maybe you want, might want to, oh, sorry. So when the property merges, this all becomes one instead of two separate lots. That I, would I would make that a condition. What about just attaching that to one of the two lots? Add it to 24 or 25? Well, they, they own the both. This, they're they're the same owners. But they're two separate lots now. Well, yes, because they're divided by the paper street. Right. So I'm saying instead of making taking all three and making it one, maybe take that Hunt Street and attach it to either 24 or 25 so they still maintain the two lots. That means they would get a second lot to improve or sell off and create another dwelling, which I would not want. That would so intensify the neighborhood. It's a pretty narrow street anyway. It's a pretty they narrow lot. 24. Lot 24 is. Thank you. Yeah. Could they improve 24 now? Pretty no, narrow. It's sub yeah. substandard. Oh, yeah. gotcha. It's also, it's also, even if it did merge, I think it's pretty substandard anyway. It's it only still would be 40 feet wide. Okay. But, oh. um, Thank you. you know, maybe the other condition would be. Mayor, along that same line, is to say one condition on the approval of St. Charles, the adjoining owner, mm -hmm. writing. Two condition that it's it's one merged lot, and three that it's no further subdivisions are permitted. That's where I'm going, Brian. Okay. You speak the same language. Yes. Well, <laughs> nice having a real estate lawyer <laughs> up in that seat. Anybody? Any other board comments or concerns? Open up to the general public for a question comment. On process, procedure, any of it? Drew. Drew. Drew Biondo, 115 Jones Avenue. So does the village just convey this to the property owner? Yes. No money changes hands. Right. Okay. So the applicant pays for the, the survey and, Everyone you know, who borders the property has to agree to this. Correct. Right. So if there are, if 24 and 25 are different property owners, you'd each be entitled to halfway in to the middle of the street if 24 didn't want it then 25 could take all got it okay right. thank you you're welcome does it increase the tax yes eventually yes. It will. yeah yep. okay. it's unimproved land so it's yeah. really not a tremendous burden to the assessment but yep. it does add value thank you. Ka kathleen kathleen riley 17 leeward lane uh what happens if he sells one of the properties well, that's why we're saying we want the lots to merge so that it be, it becomes one and it can no, no longer, therefore, be subdivided. Okay. I guess I would just make my comment. Correct. They probably want to build a garage, I would suspect. Or, you know, pool. Yeah. That's fine. Any other comments, Barbara? Sabatino, I see wheels churning in your head there. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara Sabatino, 2 Westview Avenue. Okay. Did the property owner generate this? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. So that 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 answers that puzzled look because yeah. you know if he hadn't, it may cause 
more problems for the property owner than, you know. So this happened on Westview, where um, Westview was also a paper street, and uh, a former administration had asked the two neighbors on each side, "Do you want to do this?" And uh, and I think they had, but but it just brought up a lot of, you know. Now now we're. Um, the three lots will be merged, and if the, on this, mm -hmm. so if the three lots are merged, but the same owner, mm -hmm. okay, who does or does not live in one of these properties, okay, decides that they want to sell, all of a sudden are they selling more than the, you know, like, gee, I'm old, I want to move, but I don't want to sell the whole thing. I just want to sell that original. Do they have to now subdivide yeah that well i'm 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 suggesting that we make that a condition to the abandonment that the two lots that are separated by this nub hunt street mm -hmm. are now merged so that it's a one lot and then when they do retire sell or convey they have to retake convey the entire parcel, entire parcel becomes one okay that may come back to bite them but well, you know it's it's their decision so exactly that, that take it or decision. leave it right yeah definitely Be careful what you wish for Absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome, Barbara. Yeah, Kathy Ann? 1,200 square feet, just how small it is. And the, other, the, other, the other thing that we're thinking of, you know, we're, we're not abandoning this little request. It's not really uh, like abandoning the Broadway. It probably, quite I didn't see it myself, but I'm almost going to guarantee you that it probably is. It's not open, so it's probably not developed. So you wouldn't even really even know where the boundary was. Right. Uh, who bears the cost of any uh, legal work? that has to be done to merge the three properties, new surveys, all that. Yeah, okay. so they produced all these documents before us. Okay. And so they'll create, the surveyor will create now a legal description and they'll pay the cost to record and draft the deed. Right. If, if there were other larger parcels that made larger developable parcels, we would consider a compensation structure, an item where that would be, we've had, we had an application before where there was a kind of a push through of an abandoned street end that actually then made an adjoining lot buildable that was previously vacant. That was something that we would consider consideration on. On um, this, it's only 1,200 square feet, 40 by 30. It's, it's smaller than a front yard, would be quite frankly. And I would almost think they probably think it's their front yard, but it actually is not. Yeah, right, yeah, exactly. Are there any comments from the board and or the public? Motion to close the public hearing. Yeah. Motion by Cassay, seconded by Shepro. All in favor? Aye. Motion to approve. Yeah. Motion by Cassay, seconded by Laux. All in favor? Aye. With the conditions. With the three conditions. Great. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Brian. Okay, we're going to go to trustee reports, and I will start at my far right with newly elected trustee Shepro. <laughs> Out of order. I gotta mix it up every night. Okay. Um, so I have four things that I'd like to report on tonight, um, as you see in the agenda. Um, first, uh, recreation update. <coughs> I really wanted to take a second to highlight the relationship that our recreation director is building with the Port Jeff Union Free School District uh, athletic director. Um, they have reached some agreements and in, in their discussions to. Um, allow the village to utilize some of the athletic facilities at the appropriate cost, but um, to, to really partner in creating more activities and events for our students and adults and children. So I uh, thought that would be of interest. The senior programs that were established, I guess, back in April or May, they were moved from the village center uh, due to the... Um, due to the summer camps that are being held down there. And so they were moved up to the Port Jeff Country Club. And so up there they have water art, the Watercolor and Art Club, um, Book Club, and Sitter Size. And those programs will move back to the Village Center uh, when, back in, in September when the uh, Village Center is relieved from all the screaming kids. So, and the, who are having a lot of fun. Um, the village golf outing, I just wanted to give a quick update on that. We went through some processes and the uh, board and the CCMAC approved 
opening up our village golf outing to the entire Port Jefferson community. So that will include Port Jefferson Fire Department volunteers, um, Port Jefferson Union Free School District employees, Port Jefferson Village employees, and all the residents of Port Jefferson Village. So we're opening up the Country Club for use at this outing by everybody who lives and works in Port Jefferson. Proof of employment is required, as is proof, proof of residence. So we also reduce the fee for the village outing to be to $50, which is quite reasonable and includes all kinds of awards and uh, tr trophies, prizes, and uh, a, a meal, and um, the 18 holes of golf, including card fees and green fees. So sign up is, is ongoing, and the outing is September 22nd, and it's a 1 p.m. shotgun start. Um, Two amazing upcoming trips that I thought I would mention because they sound so fun is the trip, or interesting, um, Friday, October 14th to the 9-11 Memorial, which includes Ground Zero Tour and Museum, World Trade Center, Oculus, and St. Paul's Chapel. Um, that trip has to be reserved by September 1st. And then on November 13th, there's a bus trip to Broadway to see Beautiful Noise, the Neil Diamond life story. So that is, um, must, tickets must be purchased by October 22nd. Uh, very reasonably priced too. Um, Trustee Laux and I have agreed to work together on establishing or reinstating the Village Recreation Committee with a twist uh, that the committee be composed of seven to nine village residents who can provide feedback and guidance leading to recommendations to the Board of Trustees for improvements to parks, facilities, and recreation programming since the two departments work so closely together and they're so interconnected. So our next step is to establish its charter and to identify candidates for the committee who can best represent the community's needs. Um, summer camps end on August 12th, 120, 136 children participating, adult tennis and pickleball programs, 339 adult participating will continue until October outside, run by Alex Dank. <laughs> um, so, and in November through March, they'll be held indoor at the Scraggy Hill Gym and Spring Street Gym, furthering that relationship that I mentioned earlier. Adult softball summer league playoffs starts this week, tomorrow night, the women's playoffs. We'll know that the, the women's championship team tomorrow night. Um, new adult programs, oil painting, intro to acrylic classes, Mediterranean food demos, and beach yoga. So check out the recreation site. There's a lot of great programs being held. Um, senior club start on Wednesday starts again on September 7th. Next up, building. Um, uh, a more broader and more inclusive sort of town gown relationship with Stony Brook University and uh, blending our resources following a discussion uh, that the mayor had with Joan Dickinson, who is the director of community relations at Stony Brook University. Several weeks ago, the village is proposing to establish a think tank of sorts made up of researchers and scientists at Stony Brook who live in Port Jefferson and who can engage and, and consult on the opportunities and challenges in their hometown village. Um, this could include marine sciences, um, engineering sciences, environmental sustainability, education, health, wellness, culture, society. It, it doesn't stop. There's so many opportunities to, to bring in the knowledge of these uh, experts and the education that they can help us, well, that the education, that their expertise would provide. Um, we could even like look at, at uh, Port Jefferson as sort of a living laboratory for their educating their students and their graduate students. Um, an, on another note uh, with Stony Brook is we'd like to look into creating internship and experiential employment opportunities for Stony Brook students and maybe even Suffolk County Community College students, Drew Biondo. Um, 
including communications, recreation, and economic development, and possibly others. Along with internship and experiential opportunities, I've been advised that the Career Center at Stony Brook just launched the Center for Service Learning and Community Service. So there's two very high-level people who work in the Career Center at Stony Brook who live in Port Jefferson as well. So it's another strong connection and more to come on that. Just a quick note on communications audit that an, an audit is not a bad word. It's like a, it's like an explo exploratory kind of thing. It's not like a, um, a negative connotation audit. We're just trying to bring in information. Um, I've, I've had some meetings, um, some really Im important meetings and interesting meetings with our uh, web-based, um, the, uh, the people who, who Social Butterfly LLC, they do our website updates and they manage our social media. I met with our new uh, public relations director, Charmaine Famularo and Kathy Ann Snaden, Trustee Snaden, um, and I'm just sort of bringing in as much information as I can. Um, so we can really analyze and see what our opportunities and resources are. Uh, I have a, an upcoming meeting with um, uh, with Rich Harris and uh, Kevin Wood, our own Kevin Wood, and and Barbara Sakovich to sort of round out that that research. And every time I meet with somebody, I learn who else I should speak to. So um, that's very interesting and arduous. I'm sorry, I'm going on and on and on, aren't I? What? No, no, okay. <laughs> and then just one final point. Um, I am working with uh, a task force uh, on creating a, I'm working to create a task force that will address the social and hospitality aspects of the Port Jefferson Country Club to see if we can't enhance the um, welcoming feel of the, of the country club the uh, uh, accessibility of the facilities up there. While we do understand that membership is required to play golf and, and when tennis reopens to play tennis and, and pickleball, uh, we have other facilities up there that we think should be communicated and maybe programmed. So um, we're s I've started a task force of about eight members of, of residents and, and one non-resident who is a member at the club. And we're having our first meeting on Wednesday night, and we're going to go take a look at some other uh, similar facilities uh, with similar pro profiles, uh, like village-owned, municipally-owned golf courses and country clubs. So that's my update. I don't think you've been doing anything for the last two weeks, so you better get on it. I'm going to move to my far left, Trustee Cassay. Thank you. And... Uh, Thank you, Trustee Chepro. That was an impressive report. I'm looking forward to, uh, to seeing all the community members that are engaged in a lot of those initiatives as well as the university. Um, I'll try to keep mine uh, short. The Conservation Advisory Council is uh, researching bamboo code uh, that's been brought up by a few residents over the years um, and increasingly so more recently. Uh, they've uh, been advised to look at existing code in other municipalities to see what's working so they're not you know creating something from whole cloth um, and uh, so they are engaging in that research any comments or thoughts um, you know can be sent to me as the CAC liaison and I will forward them uh, to the CAC for consideration during that work um, they uh, have engaged with the uh, e-report um, you know, with our public re relations manager and trustee Snaden um, to have an upcoming article in the e-report. So we're exciting, excited to uh, see some of the committees uh, you know, helping with education uh, in these ways and uh, grateful for the e-report to get that message out. Um, been uh, active with some of the, uh, both the community garden itself on Beach Street. Again, if you haven't seen it, take a drive or a walk down Beach Street. It is, uh, the, the beds are um, delightfully overflowing with uh, veggies. We've had a lot of our gardeners uh, express great gratitude, especially with the cost of food, uh, you know, the grocery uh, prices going up. Uh, they're very grateful to be able to uh, grow their own food not just for the uh, the tastiness of it and the, the nutrition value, but also, you know, it's a great cost savings. Uh, I've received quite a few uh, questions. How do I get involved in that? Um, the lottery will, will be again in, uh, in January for uh, the 2023 beds. So um, I will start announcing in probably November and, and get everybody all engaged in that. Um, but otherwise, 
Please know that all of the programming that's at the community garden is uh, free and available to residents and non-residents. Um, so we have experts come in, uh, you know, um, community members, and speak about different subjects. I know in um, September we'll have a, uh, a program about harvesting um, and uh, planting for the autumn. So uh, everyone, whether you're a, gar a have a bed in the garden or not, um, can uh, enjoy those programs. Uh, and we've also been working with the, uh, I, I've been working with uh, Trustee Snaden on beautification, um, looking at maintaining our rain gardens uh, and pollinator gardens to make sure that they are uh, both aesthetically pleasing and uh, remain there for the pollinators, uh, you know, and to collect rain as well uh, so that they have aesthetic value and also ecological value. And that's been, uh, that's been going very well. And that's my report for today. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. Trustee Laux. I had a very short report, and it's now even shorter. Um, Lauren touched upon the uh, September 22nd annual village outing. Uh, I really encourage the village to take part in this. We've expanded it, as she explained. Anyone who lives, works, in the village of Port Jefferson is eligible to come up and play in this village outing. Uh, you don't have to have a foursome to come up there. You can enter as a single and we will make sure that you get into a group. It's going to be a great affair this year. And as I said, Lauren covered most of it. Uh, this coming week is the beginning of the club championships up at the country club. Uh, the Women's Championships will be held on August 6th, 7th, and the 14th. The Men's Championships will be held on the 6th, 7th, 13th, and 14th. The 14th will be the final round for all levels of play. Uh, we have a category for every ability group. We have a championship for pretty much every ability group. Uh, the junior championships will be held on the 6th and 7th. The junior championships are for those youngsters 17 and under. These championships are divided, as I said, into skill levels, and they're open to all members of the country club. I just want to say a few words about the past couple of events that the village has held. Uh, we kind of overlooked the parks department. Uh, the Parks Department is responsible for a lot of things in this village that a lot of us are not aware of. Uh, they take care of every park in the village. They take care of a lot of grassy areas in the village that are not considered parks. The flowers that you see, the garden work that you see, this is all attributed to our Parks Department, and I think they deserve a lot of credit that... Uh, Many times you'll see them out there with the white trucks and the blue uniforms. If you see them working, stop, say hello, thank them for what they do. They're always out there working for the village. And that's pretty much my report. Thank you, Stan. That's so true. Guys working hard in the heat. <clears throat> Deputy Mayor Snaden, please. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I wanted to report on um, Port Paws doc dogs, but Kevin gave such a thorough report on that. Um, I can just give you a little bit of my experience. Um, I was there uh, with my dog. Kevin encouraged my dog with zero training to enter this giant diving in a big pool of water scary thing, and I tried it, and my dog did not jump off the dock. She did enjoy running down the ramp and then taking a little leap into the pool, but it was a great experience. And my reason in saying that is that this was an event, even though it was uh, created for everyone and you know dogs that are gonna do this jumping event, um, I felt welcome there with my dog who didn't have this experience, who is not an athlete. Um, and we got up there and just had a, had a blast and was made to feel everybody's included. So kudos to Kevin, um, our parks department, our highway department, our code department. Um, it truly takes a village and, and to everyone who came out and our volunteers. It was a great event and I look forward to many more. Thank you, Kevin. Um, as liaison to public safety, um, the mayor and I had um, a wonderful meeting with the uh, current interim inspector, um, D'Agostino, 
D'Agostino, did I pronounce that right? who has taken the position um, for Inspector Riley, who was our uh, main contact at the 6th Precinct. Um, and any issues or problems that we would have, we would go to Inspector Riley. He has retired. We thank him for his service. Um, he had been wonderful, um, but just as wonderful as is Inspector uh, D'Agostino, and we look forward to working with him. We thank him for coming in, taking the time out of his day to meet with us and discuss um, ongoing issues here in the village, and we look forward to working with him more in the future. As uh, the new commissioner of the building and planning department, um, I've been starting meetings with um, Richard Harris, who's heading up that department currently, and the staff up there to come up to speed on all of the um, changes and improvements going on up there. So I look forward to gaining more information and to be reporting on that department um, as we go forward. As liaison to the ARC, the Architectural Review Committee, we have two new members um, that were appointed tonight, Gerard Gang and Jennifer Testa. We look forward to working with them. Uh, we have three issues in front of us currently uh, that we are scheduled this week to meet on. Uh, one is 135 West Broadway. That's the M&T kiosk uh, that's downtown, the, the bank ATM kiosk. Uh, the other one is 217 West Broadway, which is the Overbay Apartments. Um, they put in for a new, uh, for a permanent sign. The sign that they have up there is temporary, so we're looking at the des design on their signage. And uh, the last one is 134 Main Street, which is the bar method. It's a workout studio that is coming to um, the mall, the back of the mall. The address is 134 Main, but it's the back of the mall right next to the Port Jeff Lobster House. So we look forward to them coming in as well. Um, they're looking for uh, some uh, exterior renovations um, that, that we've been asked um, and tasked to look at and give our opinion on uh, with the ARC. Uh, my beautification initiative, some things I've been working on there. Uh, Rebecca touched on um, a collaboration that we have started uh, with Harborfront Park was one of them. Kevin had called and said that there was um, a garden area there right before the uh, music festival this past weekend that needed some attention. Um, so I got in touch with Rebecca and together we went down there. We met with Dave and our wonderful parks department and putting all of our minds together, we're able to identify plants, um, figure out what needed to be um, shaped and uh, moved around. Um, Rebecca was wonderful to take a bunch of those plants over to her community garden to fill in a, a new bed that they had planted there. Uh, we added some new plants with some instant color to make the area that Kevin had concern about nice and bright and happy for our um, Port Palooza Festival. So that was a great collaboration, very happy with that. Uh, Village Hall Gardens, that was a, a project that um, has been ongoing, but as you can see out in front of Village Hall, everything is now, almost everything is now in bloom, um, and I think looks wonderful, and um, Rebecca and her group um, attended to the rain garden out front. Um, we had, did have some complaints that as you pull out of Village Hall, when you look to the left, it was very hard to see anybody walking down the sidewalk, um, so that was addressed. Thank you for that, um, and again to Dave and our Parks Department for helping out with all of those projects. Um, the Arden pa Pocket Park, that's another one, it's hard to say, Arden Pocket Park, where we have the new tables and benches. Um, we had some flowers and plants uh, left, I'll say left over from when we filled all the barrels and the new planters uptown, and I had um, asked Dave if that was a uh, location that would work to put them in, and if you go now, you see they have totally filled in and taken over that area. It's right by the phone booth, and every time I drive down, I love seeing people taking pictures there with the phone booth and the flowers in the background, so I'm really happy about that little park. Um, the Anchor Garden is in bloom. Um, that's something to see, and also the, kill, the garden next to Kilwins. Everything is kind of taken off, so it looks beautiful as you're walking around town. Um, remember to take, an eye, uh, take a minute to look at those. And my last update is on Arlington Avenue. Anyone that lives up there, um, you can see that a lot of work has been done most recently. Um, they have started the layers of paving and they are still on track to be finished with that and that road opened hopefully uh, by the end of summer. So that concludes my report. Thanks, Kathy Ann, and thank you. I think the Village Hall looks, I think, during my tenure, this is the most beautiful the front of Village Hall has looked, so really thank you for your, your thoughtfulness and your design, and I love the classic white. It's really stunning. Thank you. A um, couple things I don't know I didn't hear. Night Herons have an exhibit on the second floor at Port Jeff Living Room. Great local artist group. Their artwork is great. Um, they're local. They do local uh, pastel, oil, different types of mediums, some local pieces, and they are for sale, so it's a way you can support the local artists. 
We have a bunch of concerts. August is banging with concerts down at Harborfront Park. The Wednesday night concert series by the Arts Council is fabulous. Don't miss it. It's usually like blues and, you know, great stuff. Um, free. Get your lawn chair down there. See the sunset. On August 25th, we have our closing concert on the Ferry Pier. Um, it's called the Hitmen Classic Rock. When you're down there and you see that boat come in right on top of you, it's pretty, it's pretty spectacular. So don't miss that. And then we have a partner, Lysek, down at the Boat Shed Building. They're doing their dirty quick and boat build, uh, build a boat out of a kit on Saturday. Then you race it on Sunday and see if it floats. And it's a lot of fun to watch that. So um, thanks to our pr uh, partners down at Harborfront Park and keeping the uh, park busy. Um, so a couple more important updates. Uh, I have uh, information on phase one, which is, of course, the tow line bluff project. It's an eight-month-long project. It's going to start mobilizing next week down at East Beach. Uh, you'll start to see large boulders and the steel uh, being delivered to the parking lot area. They're going to start to mobilize and uh, with construction. Uh, so unfortunately, the beach folks will be closed. You can walk down, but you got to stay away from the major construction. They're going to be using uh, heavy equipment along the beach, and they'll be using the ramp area. Um, we're banging in uh, over 250 linear feet of steel down at the, buff, the bluff of the base of the bluff. Then we're bolstering that with, you know, the splash wall, large boulder, kind of like the seawall that protects the parking lot. And then um, we, we can't work uh, through the dead of winter, so the planting season, we're probably going to miss the planting season of fall. So the entire bluff line, 453 linear feet, is going to be um, sloped and revegetated, and so that more than likely will be happening in the spring months. So it's a long project. It's a lot of stabilization, and that is underway. Phase two, um, I did a presentation to the board. Um, the presentation is online. You can go up to portjeff.com, go to shortcuts, the key, the button at the top, and then you'll see capital projects. Uh, phase two, the engineer plans are, uh, we're just waiting for some last specifications on those documents. That project will be going out to bid just so that we can get the information and see what the numbers look like. Uh, there is also an update on any um, retreating opportunities, you know, demoing the country club building, building another facility across the parking lot, still doing some fact gathering. But um, we need to have the hard numbers before we can make any real decisions. Uh, we will be doing a presentation to the public, informing you all along the way. But as we do collect all this data, you know, we, we just have to keep putting all these pieces together. It's, it's a pretty complicated process. Um, we are starting actually last Friday. They mobilized on repairing a very large recharge basin that runs from the bottom of Old Homestead. If you come along that squiggly turn, you'll see a gate on the right-hand side, and that recharge basin runs all the way down to Oakwood Road. And when we had that really bad Isaias rainstorm, Ida, Ida, one of those eyes. Um, she blew out the, that whole entire recharge basin and the head wall and all the debris came out onto Oakwood Road. You, we got that repaved. Um, we do have, uh, you know, an application in to FEMA to be completely reimbursed because this is a million dollar project, folks. Million dollars going to a recharge basin. The recharge basin services 55 acres of stormwater runoff from that entire Harbor Hills, you know, Old Homestead, Soundview, um, um, Sands Lane, Peninsula, it services all of that development. So uh, we did a presentation that's also up on the web. It's fascinating, but we have to we have to rebuild the recharge basin. Otherwise, we will have literally a river runs through Port Jefferson. So these are large projects that take a lot of engineering, a lot of time, and really cool. Um, we met with Orsted, uh, the wind power project that will be happening off the South Fork, uh, anticipated 25, 26 year um, start. Uh, they have partnered, thankfully, with National Grid to use the National Grid Pier uh, to bring in the service vessel when the service vessel will come. Uh, the service vessel is almost as big as a ferry. It looks a little bit different, but it will house anywhere from 35 to 40 employees. The boat will come in for a six to eight hour period. It will come in either every second or third week of the month. It'll take uh, approximately six to eight hours to offload the employees onload new provisions, onload the new staff of, you know, mechanics, research people, largely to service the wind farms that are out there, and then the boat will leave. And you'll probably see it come and go during the day. 
Um, and we're grateful that they're using the National Grid Pier because obviously there's nothing that needs to be built. They reported that, that the, ma the marine engineers found the pier to be stable, accessible, um, so m very little impact. And it's getting further south in the harbor, so we won't really hear the vessel too much. It'll be a very soft use, um, and we're very excited about that because anything that enhances the value of that location enhances the value for the village, and we're always happy to support green energy. Um, so we're uh, happy to get that update from the Orsted team. Uh, met with uh, Interim Inspector D'Agostino, as Kathy Ann reported. I uh, just really wanted to thank uh, former Inspector Pat Riley and his service to the 6th Precinct and to, the, and to this community for over five years. Um, we've always had a great working relationship with Suffolk. Um, Pat, you know, really, uh, there was no change of guard when he came on board. Um, I think it's been the sixth inspector that I've had the pleasure of working with, and we're hoping that uh, Eric D'Agostino stays with us because it'll be a continuity of service and people who know us here in the sixth. So we wish Pat well, him, him and his family who live locally, and they enjoy coming down to the village of Port Jefferson. Uh, last thing is uh, LISEC, and um, we're doing a little partnership with LISEC. I think we're going to try and get Len to come to the next board meeting and make a presentation to the Board of Trustees. Um, in cooperation with our village historian, Chris Ryan, and the Drown Meadow Cottage Museum, uh, we're, we've, we're commissioning the LISEC organization to build a whale boat for the village of Port Jefferson. It's not a whale boat to go f fishing for whales. It's a whale boat that was infamously used during the spy ring. And there are only three known, two of which are not in service. And so our whale boat will be something that we can use for programming, um, for uh, demonstrations down at the Spy Ring Museum. And there's a guy who's very interested in doing a documentary on this so that it will really connect us to the Spy Ring. There's a lot of exciting stuff connected to this. So it's uh, something I'm excited about. And I think when Len makes the presentation of the Board of Trustees, you guys will be excited as I am. Um, and with that, I think I'm going to open it up to the public because I think you've heard a lot of really cool things tonight. So who wants to go first? Who's bursting to say something? Mayor, can I just uh, add one more yes, thing? Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's okay. But I would be remiss if I did not mention the regatta. You want to, you want to? Oh, right. Yep. Yeah, sure. You, 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 me? Yeah. Okay. So, um, I think this is going to be the 13th, Barb. The 13th annual Village Cup Regatta, where we race against Mather, Port Jeff Yacht Club lends us or facilitates the, the race uh, by providing upwards of 35 vessels. Uh, the vessels are owned and captained by members of the Port Jeff Yacht Club. Uh, they divide the fleet uh, pretty evenly, we hope, and uh, we get half the boats and Mather gets the other half, and we have to um, man those boats, and so we need volunteers for Team Port Jeff to help us sail. Uh, it's fierce competition, folks. I have cup, and I do not want to give cup up. <laughs> but uh, we've uh, most importantly, we're raising money for the Lust Garden Foundation and for pancreatic cancer. And it's a really fantastic day in the village. Um, it's the only event that takes place on the harbor, and it builds great camaraderie. We have a really great day, and um, it's I think one of my favorite events. So if you're interested in in experiencing you know, the, the cup, it starts 9.30 in the morning, bright and early. You get on your boat, you do the parade, then you have cocktails and lunch. Then you go out <laughs> on the boat, and then you go out and you race, and you come back in and have a great reception. And it's really a team-building effort, and I think we're almost close to, what's the amount of money, Barb? We like 800000 Yeah. Yeah, which is fantastic. So, uh, you know, it's a great cause. And Ralph Marciano from... Macho, sorry, Ralph. Uh, it's gonna come kick my, you know what? Um, you know he's our celebrity lead, and um, we have a good time. We have a really good time. His wife Phyllis works at the um, palliative care unit up at Mather, so she's what what connects the glue to Mather and Port Jeff. So uh, we have a good day. Thanks, Lauren. Okay, so Bruce Miller. So your hand go up. So you're it. I think we each, do we each have a document, Bruce, or is this just for mine? Is this me? I didn't hear that. Everybody? Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, well, greetings, uh, Mayor Garant from this side of the podium. Name and, name and address for the record, Bruce. I know, it's coming soon. Uh, Bruce Miller, 109 Scraggy Hill Road. Um, uh, 
uh, also uh, greetings to members of the board and congratulations uh, to Lauren and Rebecca on their election. Um, I also wanted to thank, over the years, uh, Charmaine Famularo for her professionalism and, and uh, with the e-report. Um, this pertains to uh, the Long Island Railroad, and I wanted to turn this over. Um, so, concepts. First, the MTA is receiving $10 billion for infrastructure improvements. We along the Port Jefferson line need a small part of this money for better Long Island Railroad service. Second, the Long Island Railroad is not exempt from going green. Diesel propulsion is unacceptable. Uh, electrically driven one-seat rides from Port Jefferson to Manhattan are possible and practical. Uh, the Long Island Railroad recently announced that battery electrification from the Port Jefferson line is off the table. I have spoken with then Long Island Railroad President Phil Ng and more recently the Long Island Railroad Executive Planning and Technical Staff about this. Uh, the staff uh, iterated plans for the Port Jefferson branch. Um, it was uh, some of the concepts they were suggesting was promoted double tracking, um, bridge expansion and construction, electrification, and the possibility of battery-powered trains. I got the sense from this discussion that the Long Island Railroad plans were so grandiose they were no plans at all but an excuse to do nothing for central and northern Long Island. We on the North Shore might need less bells and whistles and just a reasonable upgrade to some kind of electric service. Uh, dual um, propulsion locomotives are in very limited use now. Uh, third rail electrical service, obviously, or battery powered service. Uh, in the old, old days, trains needed to have an energy car, a coal car on the train for energy. Uh, is the third rail too expensive? I don't know. We must go green even if it means a little inconvenience to the Long Island Railroad. Perhaps a battery car. Battery cars that can be charged and then swapped at Huntington and Port Jefferson. The Long Island Railroad and the NTA need to get uh, with the program. New York state law requires green energy priorities. The Long Island Railroad and MTA are not exempt from this. Albany has a very strong legislated priority for green energy and transportation. Commuters from Calverton, Wading River, and along the Port Jefferson line uh, go into, even to Greenlawn, are going to the Ronkonkoma line for transportation, not using their home stations. Uh, some Port Jefferson and Stony Brook residents even drive to Huntington and Hicksville for decent transportation. This is very ungreen, mass transit for part of the trip, automobile traffic for 10 or uh, 20 needless miles. Then more land taken for asphalt and green uh, or in garage structures or the alternative, brown diesel transportation for Port Jefferson and Stony Brook that cannot enter uh, Penn Station or the future Grand Central Madison stations. New York City tunnels require us to either transfer uh, often in inclement weather to get to New York or to commute to the commute and then to com begin to commute. The, this rules out what the Long Island Railroad uh, people refer to as a one seat ride. The Long Island Railroad strips the Long Island Railroad strips nor the North Shore of its commuters and then argues we do not have enough ridership to invest in upgrades. We are among the farthest commuters from New York City and pay almost the highest fares, yet we have the shabbiest service, sometimes standing from Huntington or Hicksville to Penn Station. Uh, most travelers on the Long Island have had electrical service for a generation, some of them for three generations. 
after spending hundreds of millions of dollars on rail service that sometimes competes with our own, we need a small part of the $10 billion for what I have called a better ride. Newsday recently reported on the plan to spend billions of dollars on Penn Station and billions on the east side access. We are asking for a few million. Uh, Steve Engelbright and Kara Hahn have advocated for moving the Port Jefferson train station west to the Lawrence Aviation property. The Lawrence Aviation property is 120 acres. 440 acres has been allocated for the Long Island Railroad station and rail sidings. Uh, during my conversations with the Long Island Railroad executive planning and technical staff, they have stated that they do not believe 40 acres uh, is sufficient. So the question is, did they ask for more? Uh, Port Jefferson needs to engage with Mr. Engelbright and Ms. Hahn to negotiate an adequate tract of land with the Long Island Railroad uh, west of 25A-112. The, the advantage to this pr project is great. The residents of the MTA and the LIR are um, not particularly responsive to uh, community needs and if the project are of minimal benefit to the MTA and the LIIR, uh, they show a, a, a profound disregard and arrogance for local residents. Uh, advantages to Port Jefferson, elimination of the Main Street 25A-112 crossing and resultant traffic reduction. Uh, the freeing up of rail yards east of the existing station for a swap of land and subsequent incorporation into Port Jefferson Village. Development as clean light industry uh, with concurrent uh, real estate uh, tax revenue. The freeing up of the existing station property for parkland and recreation. Again, we need part of the $20 billion windfall to be spent in the Port Jefferson Stony Brook area. This is urgent. These decisions are being made now. Uh, the opportunity will not come for another generation. Uh, Margo, you might want to assign someone to work with the uh, USGBC Long Island. This is a green building committee uh, for Long Island sustainable transportation. Um, electrification is the high priority for them as well as the Sierra, Sierra Club. They also sponsor a large number of interesting projects uh, and activities promoting green transportation for Long Island residents, perhaps even form a committee to look into this. Um, Enlist the support of Mr. Engelbright and or NICOM to get discussions started with Governor Hochul or her staff. I doubt she is aware of this issue in this region. Our leaders need to cash in some chips for their constituencies. Uh, I have kept contact with the Port Jefferson and Port Jefferson Station Terryville Chambers of Commerce and the Port Jefferson Station Terryville Civic Association. They are interested and support this project as well. Uh, thank you for listening. Bruce Miller, and I've included the uh, contact information on that. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you for your thoughtfulness in putting this document together. Yes. Mayor, as the new uh, Commissioner of Environmental Sustainability, I'd be happy to follow up on this. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss it. Thank you. Yeah, I want to check in with Sarah Lansdale at Suffolk County Planning Level first on the Lawrence, but yes. Okay, thank you. Is it Mark? Mark. Oh, thank oh, God. Good. Mark, come on up. My name. <laughs> Mark Croft, uh, <laughs> and I'm 11 Leeward Lane in the Highlands. And I just wanted to add something in support there, um, as, as well as all the points that have been mentioned here. People here, um, and if you're close, certainly, to the Highlands or other areas, and I imagine on the other side of the tracks as well, there's a very significant droning that you can hear at the Long Island Railroad. The diesel trains that they have right now are not easily capable of being turned off and turned on. So they are running in idle 
for prolonged periods of time. And the diesel fuel that is being burned during that period of time is primarily distributed in an area up to maybe 500 feet to either side of the tracks with significant polluting values for sometimes 20, 30, 40 minutes, causing significant you know, health issues and a potential for at least people in the highlands. Some people yeah. report jet station, and that needs to be added on to the situation, as well as the traffic interruptions along the pathway that we have of Port Jefferson Patrick Road when the train is coming through, which would be not necessarily required, and there are a number of cars sitting and obviously idling you know, for that. So those are also significant concerns that would be benefited by transition to electrification. I just want to point that out. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Anyone else this evening? Guys look a little bleary-eyed out there. You're all with me still? Okay. Uh, motion to adjourn on this beautiful August summer night. Second by Trustee Laux, and all in favor? Aye. Thanks for attending, folks. Thanks for staying involved.